Let me read two verses to begin. The first is in Proverbs 24, 7 that says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And the second one is in Isaiah 25, verse 1. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee. I will give thanks to thy name, for thou hast worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. What we began doing several weeks ago before the series on counseling was to talk about the American mind of 1776. And we do it because understanding why the people in 1776 thought the way they thought will help you understand what they meant when they wrote the Constitution of the United States, when they declared their independence from England, when they fought a war for independence, and you will understand something about what this nation was created to be. Now, that's important on a lot of levels. It's important because today, in most history books, In all public school history books, and even in some Christian books, uh, we're not told the truth as to what Americans thought in 1776. We're not told the truth. We're not told the truth what the Declaration of Independence and the American War of Independence meant. And we certainly aren't told the truth in what the Constitution of the United States means and what those basic ideas were that gave birth to this nation. Remember the the series, Ideas Have Consequences. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what's good about this country is the result of the ideas that most Americans had in 1776. And the reason the country has failed is because most Americans no longer believe those ideas and have that mindset. Now, if you look at this one pager, if you were any of my history classes on American history, you would have memorized that. I usually give my classes, I give them a list like this, and I give them 40 seconds to memorize it. And they do, from 12-year-old on up. It'll be harder for you adults. I want you, before next week, you adults, to memorize, in order, these 16 roots of the American mind. Because if you understand these roots, you'll understand why Americans thought the way they thought in 1776 and gave birth to the nation they gave birth to. Now, we have already talked about a few of these, so let's go back and review since it's been so long since we talked about them. One of the first roots of the American mind is in the biblical doctrine of the creation of man and woman. Our founding fathers believed the Bible. They believed that those early chapters of Genesis uh, recounted literal history, that they were historical narrative and not myth nor poetry, and so they took them seriously. And when they read about Adam and Eve, they understood two things that define human beings. They understood that they were made in the image of God, and they understood that they were given the mandate from God to multiply, subdue the earth, and exercise dominion over it. So those two thoughts had a great impact upon most Americans in 1776 when they thought about man being in the image of God with the mandate to exercise dominion. Now let me explain the effect of those. Number one, because man is made in the image of God, man has dignity. Man was created mature. Man was not uh, created to play. He was not created to uh, uh, live an infantile life, a childish life. He was created to be dignified and mature and majestic and intelligent. And that was the standard. They wanted themselves and their children to live with dignity. Very few people, Christians, in the United States today live with dignity. Very few dress with dignity. Very few speak with dignity. Very few deal with other people with dignity. And without this sense of dignity and this sense of maturity, I will always be children. So they understood what dignity meant. Secondly, they understood that this mandate of dominion made them civilization builders. That Adam and Eve were called by God to build civilizations down through their generations based upon the word of God to the glory of God. And so our founding fathers in the early 1600s come to this country to build a new civilization. A new civilization that would not be stained by tyranny, but would be built upon the premise that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all of life and his word is of comprehensive authority. So here you see how the, the, the creation of man and woman is taught in the Bible influenced the way our founding fathers thought and the way they lived 
They understood that man was created with dignity and maturity and that man was given by God the responsibility not to sit back and play guitar and wait for Jesus to come, but to build civilizations and to persevere at building civilizations that were based upon the Word of God down through their generations. The next root of the American mind is the eternal plan of God. The vast majority of these early Americans were Calvinists. In 1789, at least a third of them spoke with a Scottish accent. That is, besides the English Puritans, the German Reformed, the Dutch Calvinists, and French Huguenot, there was this powerful Scotch-Irish and Covenanter and Scottish influence that was Calvinistic to the core. And so most Americans believed the biblical doctrine of the eternal plan of God. They believed that God had a plan. He worked out that plan before all eternity. And now he's carrying out that plan and nothing can frustrate him. And nothing can keep him from carrying out his plan. And that plan has in it every detail of life, good things and bad things. They would be shocked if they could come into the future today and hear Christians say that, uh, well, God has planned out the good things and Satan has planned out the tr tragic and calamitous things. They'd be shocked at such a heretical thought. They believe what Isaiah 20, 14, verses 24 and 27 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened, and just as I have planned, so it will stand. For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? That God has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass in time in the lives of angels and men. Good times, bad times. Tragedy, joys. Everything is the working out of God's plan and God's sovereign will. Nothing happens in life unless God wills it. Now, what did that make of them? A bunch of fatalists who just sit back and twiddle their thumbs and say, well, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. No, America would never have been established if they'd have done that. They come over on the Mayflower. Many of them die on the way. The first year, half of the pilgrims die. They face the bloodiest war percentage-wise in American history, King Philip's War, when the Wampanoag chief has his desire of wiping out Christendom in North America. Almost does it. They face difficulty after difficulty, bizarre, satanic attack like Salem, Massachusetts, etc. The assaults of the king to try to undermine everything they wanted to do and rob them of their wealth and their, and their liberty. They withstood all that. They weren't fatalists. They didn't sit back and twiddle their thumbs. They knew God had a purpose for everything. Even the tragedy, even when the enemies, Indians came burning down the town, even when they died of sickness and starvation, God's making us strong. God's stealing us. God's chastening us. God's putting us through the fire. And so all these difficulties, instead of causing them to retreat, pushed them forward. Because they knew that God had a plan for their life. And so the biblical doctrine of the eternal plan of God, the decree of God, predestination, was one of the foremost motivating factors in the minds and thinking of the Americans of 1776. Number three, the first root was the creation of man and woman. The second root is the eternal plan of God. The third root is the Hebrew Republic of the Old Testament. Also, these early Americans would have been shocked to hear people, today Christians, describe themselves as New Testament Christians. The thought wouldn't occur to them. They wouldn't understand the term. It would sound heretical to them to say, we're New Testament Christians because they think, why, you don't, you don't believe in the Old Testament? So they understood themselves as Bible Christians, whole Bible Christians, who believe that both Testaments in their entirety and unity apply to life. And so as a result, they saw in ancient Israel God's model for the nations. They saw unique things about Israel. In the Old Testament, there were some unique things in that they were preparing for the Messiah. But there was much about the life of Israel revealed by God in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy that gave definition to and structure to the political and social and economic life of Israel. And they saw those directions as the model for every nation thereafter. Now that's a foreign thought to many Christians today. Because what's the first thing somebody's going to say? 
they're going to say, are you talking about a theocracy? And the answer to that question is, what do you mean by theocracy? Because if they're my age or just a little younger, when they think theocracy, who do they think of? Ayatollah Khomeini and the Islamic theocracy, where there's absolutely no distinction between political rulers and clerical people. So the clerical people stand uh, on par with political rulers in commanding armies, making political decisions, etc. And of course, that's not what they mean. There's a lot of differences between the Old Testament theocracy and Islamic theocracy. Number one, it's two different gods. Number two, two different books, two different ways of life, two different moral standards. And it's the Old Testament, which is the word of God, that these people saw as the model for the nations, which means they believe that, that all nations should be a theocracy. Now, what is a theocracy biblically? See, the problem people have with the word theocracy, which is a basically a great word, because it's made up of two words, theos kratos, God's authority. That's what the word theocracy means. They wanted a nation that lived under God's authority. You ever read anything like that in Romans 13? The powers that be are ordained of God. That's a theocratic statement. And as Rush Dooney said, the source of law for any society is the God of that society. So in that sense, all nations are theocracies. All nations have a God. All nations have a source of law. The problem is that most of the nations have a different God than the God of the Scriptures. And a theocracy in the Old Testament was a nation governed by God's authority, revealed in His law, to which all men and institutions were accountable. Now, what confuses people is, because well-intending people today say, well, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the separation of church and state. They did, too. You can get Bonson's book, The Anomie in Christian Ethics, and there's a whole and wonderful chapter on how there was the institutional, functional, jurisdictional, if there is such a word, separation of church and state already in the Old Testament. Moses, head of state, Aaron, the representative of the ecclesiastical structure, etc. throughout the Old Testament. A better word than theocracy, because it is so misunderstood today and has so much baggage, though I'm not willing to give it up, is the idea that the Old Testament nation of Israel was a Hebrew Republic. One of the best books I know on the subject is called The Hebrew Republic by W.C. Wines, a Presbyterian preacher that lived in the 1800s. It's a little paperback. It's also been published under the title The Roots of the American Republic. Now, people don't normally identify ancient Israel with the republic. And it's because most people don't know what a republic is. As we go through this presidential cycle, see how many times the Democrats and the Republicans use the word republic. You only need a teeny little piece of paper to keep score. Uh, see how many times they uh, use the word democracy. You'll need a notebook. Because in their minds, it's one and the same. Of course, they'd rather be more of a democracy than a republic. And so uh, through the years, we've tried to distinguish the two because the Bible does. In fact, what happened during Korah's rebellion in the wilderness that kept them out of the promised land is they wanted a democracy, not a theocracy. We'll look that one up. But the point here is a republic is a nation governed by constitutional law enforced by representatives of that law elected by the people enforced by representatives of that law, not of the people, elected, however, by the people. And a Christian republic is a nation governed by constitutional law based upon biblical law, enforced by representatives of the law elected by the people. And what's a democracy? A democracy is a nation governed by the majority of the people manipulated and controlled by people of power. A democracy is a nation governed by the majority of people, manipulated and controlled by people of power. I get angry every time I hear conservatives root America's political order in the ancient Greek city-states and say this is where we got all our ideas of freedom and constitutionalism is from ancient Greece, Athens, Sparta, and the like with all of their democracies. 
And many of these ancient Greek city-states did have democracies. They always throw up the name Solon, S-O-L-O-N. That these ancient city-states did have democracies. They did not have republics. But every single one of those democracies degenerated into tyrannies. All of them. Has anybody ever seen any of these ancient city-states still in existence? They're gone. So uh, democracies always lead to tyrannies. Because majorities are, as you know, easily manipulated by people of power in the educational system, in the media. I mean, how many people do you know everything they believe they get from the television? You can't argue with them. They saw it on the nightly news. Or I watched that special on the History Channel. They did find the body of Jesus and his son and his mother and daddy. Majorities are easily manipulated. And our founding fathers did everything they could to keep from creating a democracy. You remember the very familiar story about Benjamin Franklin. As he came out of the Constitutional Assembly and the lady asked him, she said, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? And he said, a republic if you can keep it. And uh, we didn't keep it. Anyway, so the Hebrew Republic, uh, theocracy, was a republic. It was a nation governed by constitutional law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And I have a book in my library called The Republic of Republics which is the United States. You know, Patrick Henry, one of my favorite people in all of history, his biography impacted me like very few biographies ever have. He was a Presbyterian in Virginia when it was illegal to go to a Presbyterian church in Virginia. Patrick Henry was a man who could have been president of the United States. He was asked to be vice president. He was asked to be Supreme Court Justice of the United States Supreme Court many times. He was a famous man when Thomas Jefferson was a young, obscure attorney. And every time he was asked to take the role of some national position, he would say, I can't. God has called me to build my country. And he meant by that Virginia, which was one of the largest nations on earth. I have a a trivia question I like to ask friends that come from Illinois. And that is, who was the first governor of Illinois? His picture is in the rotunda in Illinois. And of course, the first president of Illinois was Patrick Henry, when Illinois was a county in Virginia. So they saw the Old Testament Republic as the model for what they wanted to build here. They understood that it had to be theocratic if it was to be blessed of God. They understood that nations are defined covenantally and not racially. That nations are those groups of people in covenant with God or an idol. Nations could be comprised of a variety of races. But what made a nation unified for good or for evil was the God in which it lived in covenant. And so they understood that as a nation it had to publicly and at heart live in covenant with the living God. Turn to page 5 in your paper there. And in that last paragraph, I have some of the similarities between ancient Hebrew Republic and our Constitution. Let me read that last paragraph. 19th century author E.C. Wines, in his book, The Hebrew Republic, reprinted by the Plymouth Rock Foundation under the title, The Roots of the American Republic, claims that the origin of the American Republic and its specific Constitution is to be found in the laws of Moses and the model of the Hebrew Republic of Israel, with its emphasis on an elective magistracy. In other words, people don't realize it, but in the Old Testament, the kings were elected in Israel. Did you know that? They were elected. They just didn't inherit the title. The only time they weren't elected is when Israel was in a backslidden, weak state, and it was the pawn of a larger empire, and a king was imposed upon it by a greater empire. But when things were normal, the people of Israel elected their kings. And a great book on the subject is by Samuel Rutherford called Lex Rex. Political equality, the inviolability of private property, balance of powers, enlightened public opinion. Enlightened public opinion means the duty of the civil government was periodically to teach everybody the law of God. I'm sure everybody in Israel understood its constitution. Balance of powers, enlightened public opinion, the executive chief magistrate, a constitution of limited and specified powers, a senate. Do you know that ancient Hebrew Republic had a senate? And it's called a senate. And it's comprised of representatives of 12 states of Israel. It also had a lower house that was representative of the people of Israel, the children of Israel. 
And the title of the lower house was the children of Israel. It says in the Bible, whenever Moses had a big decision to make, he called the children of Israel together. That doesn't mean he called three million people together. It meant he called the representatives of the people together. And the institutional separation of church and state. So the, one of the roots is the Hebrew Republic of the Old Testament. Then the fourth root is the Christianity of the New Testament. The Christianity of the New Testament. Turn to page six. Let's read some of this. Also, you need to have your children read in your homeschools a book by Alexis de Tocqueville entitled Democracy in America. This was a young Frenchman, came to America in the very early 1800s to try to understand why this young nation became so great so quickly in its history. And you can learn some great things about democracy in America. One of my favorite stories in his book, Trying to Find What Made America Great, so quickly. He said, I looked to its great industrial cities to find its greatness, and its greatness was not found there. He said, I went to its great educational institutions that are renowned all over the world, and I couldn't find the cause of its greatness there. I went to its political institutions in Washington, D.C., and the state capitals to find out if that's where its greatness was rooted. And I couldn't find the cause of its greatness there. He said, it wasn't until I went to the churches of America that I understood what made America great. He said, America is great because she's good. And when she ceases being good, she'll cease being great. And it was that high morality of our founding fathers that still went on into the 1800s, even after they cast aside uh, the religion of our founding fathers. But let's go here to page six. We should also go back to the Christianity of the New Testament to understand America's mindset in 1776. It cannot be argued against effectively that the vast majority of America's founding fathers and mothers were sincere and knowledgeable Christians of the Protestant and Reformed stripe. In 1834, Alexis de Tocqueville makes this observation of Americans in his book, Democracy in America. Among the Anglo-Americans, there are some who profess Christian dogmas because they believe them, and others do so because they're afraid to look as though they do not believe them. So Christianity reigns without obstacles by universal consent. Consequently, as I have said elsewhere, everything in the moral field is certain and fixed. Although the world of politics seems given over to argument and experiment, so the human spirit never sees an unlimited field before itself. However bold it is from time to time, it feels that it must halt before the insurmountable barriers. Before innovating, it is forced to accept in America certain primary assumptions and to submit its boldest conceptions to certain formalities which retard and check it. He said every now and then the American mind gets cocky and it wants to innovate and it wants to think new thoughts. And then it runs right smack dab into the solid wall of the boundaries of Christianity. And it retards the influence of humanistic thinking. He said most Americans are profess Christianity because they believe them or because they know if they don't at least profess them, they're not going to get jobs. Whereas today, if you're going to get a good job, people think you've got to act like a non-Christian. Our American fathers and mothers understood the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and its implications. Because he alone is the savior of the world, they looked to no human institution for salvation from evil. They did not demand of church, state, school, family, science, or the marketplace to do for them what only Christ can do. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. They confessed with their mouths and practiced in all the activities and relationships of their lives the fundamental Christian truth that Jesus is Lord knowing that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth and king of kings and lord of lords. Hence, America's founders built a nation and were willing to live and die for the crown rights of Christ the king. And so the roots of the American mind most definitely was in Protestant and Reformed religion. Now, over the next several pages, I give you the bits of a sermon that was preached on July the 20th, 1775, by a preacher named David Jones in Philadelphia, the title of the sermon, Defensive War in a Just Cause, Sinless. And it shows you how they would reason for defensive wars as being biblical.
And so it's well worth reading and having your children read, although we'll not take the time to read it this evening. They rooted their thoughts in the Christianity of the New Testament. They believed in a limited state because they didn't believe the state was Savior. They didn't believe the state was God. They understood that salvation from evil and all its consequences and cradle to grave security from evil came from the Lord Jesus Christ and not from the civil magistrate. They understood that. That the civil magistrate was not to provide for you from cradle to grave. It was to protect you from the bad guys and particularly to protect the church that it might be free to preach and teach the gospel of the scriptures and of Protestantism and the Reformed faith. And they believed Romans 13. Do you know there's enough material in Romans 13 and three principles to help you evaluate what any politician says to you? Now, they try to make things complicated. They try to make them appear complicated. And you look at all these laws and these resolutions and these debates, and you say, well, it's either over my head or it's just so sounds so irrelevant to me. But if you understand the three principles of Romans 13 that shape the thoughts of the Americans of 1776, you will have the ammunition to evaluate pretty much everything a politician says to you. And what are the three basic principles of Romans 13? Only Christians believe these things. Now, if you believe these things, it will separate you from conservatives and liberals. It will separate you from collectivists and libertarians. It will separate you from Republicans and Democrats. If you believe these three things, Romans 13, concerning the political institution. Number one, those three principles are the origin of civil government, the function of civil government, and the powers of civil government. The origin of civil government, the function of civil government, and the powers of civil government, of which there's three. The power of a minister, the power of the sword, and the power to tax. The power of a minister, the power of the sword, the power to tax. Let's read part of this very quickly because our founding fathers took this seriously. Romans 13, let's read the first several verses. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil behavior. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. By the way, who defines good from evil behavior? God. Our founding fathers understood that the only standard by which you can distinguish good from evil is the word of God. And if a civil magistrate does not use the standard of the word of God, it cannot distinguish good behavior from evil behavior. And if you have a civil government that has a sword in his hand and his responsibility is to punish evil behavior for the protection of good behavior, and he doesn't have any infallible standard by which he can distinguish good behavior from evil behavior, then he's just as likely to defend evil behavior against good behavior. For instance, across the street, a county sheriff and police of coming would support this abortionist if anybody broke the law with reference to him rather than doing what they should do and arrest him for murder. Now, let's go on. Verse 4, for it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God and avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Wherefore, it's necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. All right, now notice the three things this teaches us. And if you get these down, you grasp these, you can know how to criticize politicians and their laws. Number one, the origin of civil government. What does conservatism say? What does conservative republicanism say? The source of power for civil government is the people, right? Right, that's what they believe. But what they believe is dead wrong. Wokes populi, wokes dei. You remember your Latin? The voice of the people is the voice of God. That's good conservatism. Lousy Bible. You remember the Gettysburg Address that allegedly Honest Abe wrote? 
a tremendous piece of literature as far as form is concerned. But when he said that this government of the people, by the people, and for the people should not perish from the earth, he knew he was the first president in the history of the United States ever to say such a thing. And that no president before he came to the White House ever believed it. It's contrary to the Declaration of Independence. It's contrary to the United States Constitution. It's contrary to what our forefathers shed their blood for. And it mostly, more importantly, is contrary to the influence of Christianity on the American mind of 1776. That this government is to be a government of the people. That is, it originates with its power from the people. But of the people. For the people. Its ultimate goal is the people's pleasure and happiness. By the people, it's to be a democracy where the majority of people call the shots. You see, none of those prepositional phrases are true. The powers that be are ordained by the people. Is that what it says? No, it says the origin of civil government is God. This is a government of God. It's a government for God and his glory and the administration of his justice. And it is a government by representatives of constitutional law elected by the people. There's nothing true about that statement, even though he did get it from John Wick. Uh, the origin of civil government is God. Now that's important because you're accountable to your origin. That if the people are the origin of civil government, then the civil government should do whatever the people say. And if the majority of people want to abort unborn babies, then let it go. That if the majority of people want to forcibly redistribute the wealth, let it happen. If the majority of people want everybody over 65 years of age to take a suicide pill so there won't be a drain on the public resources, let it happen. This is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. See? That you're accountable to your origin. And our founding fathers understood that. And they understood that their origin was in the living God, not in man. They understood that the civil government had a function. Now you notice I use a singular word. They understood that the function, singular, of civil government is to be a terrorizer of evildoers. That's what Romans 13 says, is to terrorize evildoers. So if a criminal is trying to decide whether or not to commit a crime, if the civil government is what it should be, he's going to think twice before he does it. It is to punish the bad guys for the protection of the good guys. It is to punish bad behavior for the protection of good behavior as defined by God. That's its function. Nowhere in the Bible, and our founding fathers understood this, is its function health, education, and welfare. Nowhere is it education. In fact, the Constitution doesn't say the purpose of civil government is to provide welfare, but to promote it by the administration of justice. Its responsibility is not to own and maintain national parks. Do you know that the Constitution of the United States just flat out says that the federal government may own no land except for post offices, military posts, and public buildings. And yet the federal government of the United States owns more land in America than there is land east of the Mississippi River. You see all these various things responsibilities and authorities it has usurped and the more it usurps authorities that God hadn't assigned it the more tyrannical it becomes the higher the taxes are the less freedom you have the more justice is perverted and less effectively they do the one thing that they were called by God to do and that is protect you from the bad guys and the three powers that God has given the civil government to carry out that function are the power of the minister you notice on at least two occasions, the civil government here in Romans 13 is called a minister, and then one time a servant, which in the context, the same thing as a minister. Now, what does it mean when it says that uh, the federal government in the United States is a minister of God? Well, you consider what I am as a minister of God in the church. As a minister of God in the church, I have one divinely assigned responsibility, and that is to administer what's written in the book. I can't add to, I can't take away from I have no legislative authority. I can't come to you next Sunday and say, well, we've had 10 big commandments all these years, but I got an 11th one. Write this down. By the way, we're always having people come to church who some of them may be really in financial need. Others are fake beggars. 
and they go to school somewhere to learn how to beg because they all say the same thing, the, the exact same thing. They look around to see if they can see something that will help them to say something spiritual to get you to me to like them. So one time this lady came into my office. She's looking around. I think it was a lady. She was looking around for something. And as soon as you walk in on the left, there are these two of the Ten Commandments in what looks like broken stone. She looked at that and she said, Is that the original? <laughs> A minister doesn't have any legislative authority. I can't come tomorrow and say in church and say, listen, I got a new doctrine for you. It's not in the Bible, but here it is. By the way, there is a dispensational theology book written by the dean of dispensationalists, a man by the name of Walford, and he talks about the seven judgments, I think it's seven, at the end of time. And he twists and distorts the Bible to come up with six of these. But then when it comes to explaining his seventh, he says, whereas we have no biblical support for this seventh judgment, we know there is one or our system will be incomplete. So uh, a minister in a church has no legislative authority. He cannot create new doctrines ex nihilo, out of nothing. All right, and that's why the civil magistrate, those people you elect to office, are called ministers of God. Because the only authority they have from God is to administer what's written in the book in civil affairs. God has not given the civil government legislative authority. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a minister, he'd be a creator. That the civil government cannot create new laws unless they are administration of the law of God found in the book. And so when you look at the constitutions of the early colonies of the United States, you will find in constitution after constitution after constitution, Laws taken right out of the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You go back over a thousand years of common law, unwritten law that's guided the European Western nations for a thousand years. Where did common law begin? It began when King Alfred the Great in the uh, ninth, late ninth century, I believe, when King Alfred the Great, the king of the Anglo-Saxons, codified the laws in a book. You can still buy it, Borders or, or Barnes and Noble. And uh, you go through those, and all the good ones are from Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Bad ones he thought up from somewhere else. But that's why common law is so in accord historically with what we believe as Christians. Because of King Alfred's making the law of the Angles and the Saxons the law of Almighty God. He understood what a minister, to some degree, he understood what a minister of God was to be. In fact, back in those days, the Anglo-Saxon kings were called a word that we would say presidents today. And the Anglo-Saxon kings saw themselves, and in their own writings, they saw themselves not as so much as dictators, but as ministers of the Anglo-Saxon people. So you only want somebody in office and somebody on the federal bench who sees himself as a minister of God. And as Rushton, he said, federal judges are either defenders of biblical law or hatchet men for the humanistic status quo. And that's exactly correct. And then the second authority, power, God's given civil government is the power of the sword. You don't use swords to spread peanut butter on bread. The purpose of swords is the use of legal deadly force when necessary to protect good behavior from bad behavior as defined by God. That includes, according to the Bible, the use of execution for some crimes that are so heinous in God's sight that the only just way to punish them is by death. And of course, the big argument that people give today against uh, execution is that it doesn't deter crime. Three things you say about that is, number one, it deters the guy that was executed from ever committing the crime again. <laughs> Secondly, private execution behind closed doors where somebody is sweetly and quietly put to sleep by a needle in his arm does not deter crime. And number three, the purpose of capital punishment is not to deter crime. The purpose of capital punishment is to administer justice. The heinousness of the crime determines the severity of the punishment. And there's some crimes that are so heinous that justice demands the only way you can satisfy and administer justice is to execute those capital criminals. 
So the power of the sword also indicates the use of a military to protect a nation from those beyond the border who would seek to do that nation harm. And then the third power is the power to tax. Those are the three powers that God has given the civil government to administer the one function of protecting good behavior and punishing bad behavior. Power to tax doesn't mean the power to tax for any reason. It doesn't mean any kind of tax. Most of the taxes in the United States, when you compare them with the Bible, which is what we're supposed to do, are unbiblical, displeasing to God, and therefore economically detrimental to our culture. Like the income tax, property taxes, value-added taxes, corporation taxes, sales taxes. You just go right down the line. Now, conservatives are getting on a bandwagon for a new sales tax to replace the uh, income tax, federal income tax. Well, I hate IRS. I believe it's the Gestapo in the United States. And a graduated income tax keeps people in slavery and forcibly redistributes the wealth from hard workers and savers, entrepreneurial people, to people who don't aren't that entrepreneurial and who are not as hardworking in a strip. And that always destroys the culture. Uh, in, in Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto, where he gave all the planks as to how to move a nation from democracy and republicanism to communism, one of those planks was the establishment of graduate income tax. Sales tax punishes large families. If you have large families, you have to buy more things which means you have to pay more sales tax. Uh, the point is that in the Bible, civil governments are given the authority to levy one kind of tax and one kind of tax alone. And that is a head tax where every head of family in the nation pays the same amount, not the same percentage. Now you have some conservatives who want a, a flat tax rate, you know, where everybody pays the same percentage. Check out that percentage. See how high that percentage is. Because God says in the books of Samuel, if any civil government taxes a people as much as or more than a tenth of his salary, he's playing God because God only taxes a tenth. And uh, these flat tax rates are way above that. But uh, the point is it's a head tax where everybody pays the same amount that is so low that nobody complains. Whether you're a millionaire or whether you're not, everybody pays the same amount. Now, what is it that most Americans believe today? And what we're talking about is why the Constitution is what it was as over against how it's interpreted today. What made Americans think the way they thought? We're talking about Romans 13 here and the whole Bible and how it relates to taxation because when it comes to evaluating taxation, we don't use as our source upon Mises as great as he was. We use the Word of God because in Christ is deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so um, here, here is a, an illusion that most Americans believe. If you do, don't tell anybody. And that is, well, why should we, 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 we're not against federal income tax, graduated income tax. We just wish it was a little, a lot lower. Because after all, it's only just the more you make, the more you should pay. Who said? call Marx. Now let's redefine the more you make, the more you should be taxed. The more hardworking you are, the thrifter you are, the more you use the gifts and the talents that, that God uh, gives you to produce a product that, it, that raises the level of life for most Americans, the more effectively and intelligently you invest your money, the more jobs you provide for people who wouldn't have jobs if you weren't making a lot of money and investing it wisely, the more you should be penalized. It's not what God says. A head tax. They have the power to tax everybody the same amount. And you say, Joe, are you telling me that you think the American federal government as it is today could continue if all we had was a low head tax? No. That's the whole point. <laughs> well, we got to stop here. Next week, we'll start talking about Augustine. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the way you influenced the founders of our country. We thank you for what they gave us. Help us to clear out the rot and the cancer and the corrosion of that heritage so that we might hand it to our children more pure and unmixed. 
than it was handed to us by our sires. For Christ's sake, amen.